What I want to talk about before we wrap up here is there's um, our patriarch, our current patriarch, Johannes IV. He put together what I think is just a beautiful description of the beloved disciple as a model for our own kind of discipleship, how we can live our lives and be truly Joanite. Um, and to, to truly follow the example of the beloved disciple. Um, so he kind of breaks this down into um, uh, qualities and, and points to a, uh, how, uh, you know, examples in the Bible, in, in the fourth gospel, of how the beloved disciple was like this. And not just the fourth gospel, actually, because he draws from the other uh, three gospels and acts when they talk about John. Uh, there's a bunch of different places. Uh, we'll talk about that as, as they come up. So, uh, John was spiritually decisive. Um, he immediately takes up the call when Christ comes by. In Luke, uh, Jesus walks by John the Baptist and his group, um, and one of our spiritual successors is John the Baptist. And John the Baptist had his own little group of disciples at the time. Uh, John and James, his brother, were in a boat with his father, with their father fixing nets. And John the Baptist was on the river baptizing, preaching, doing whatever it was John the Baptist was doing, probably wearing an uncomfortable shirt. And um, and he was, and, and Jesus walks by. And John the Baptist says, forgive me, I don't know the quote exactly, behold, you know, the Lamb of God, or something like that. I think that's what he says. But anyway, he says something very nice about Jesus as Jesus walks by. And so John and his brother James drop the nets, leave the father in the boat, and take off and follow Jesus. So he, they're decisive. So spiritually decisive is, is the first quality of the beloved disciple. Willingness to be transformed. Okay, so John, when, John is, his, John's father's name is Zebedee, which uh, I believe is Hebrew for thunder. Also, or it, uh, that's the tradition anyway. I don't know Hebrew. Um, but so he's of, often called the son of thunder. John and James are the sons of thunder. Um, <laughs> and John, John has a bit of a temper. He's he's a, he's a little bit of a hothead at first. So uh, Jesus is uh, Jesus is preaching, and he isn't very well received by the crowd. And John says, "Lord, do you want us to call down the fire of heaven to destroy them?" And Jesus says, "Let's let's not do that right now. Let's do something else." But he's he's fairly he's a little bit pissed off that these guys are making fun of his buddy Jesus. So he's uh, he he. But as time progresses, John mellows out. As the story of Jesus progresses, you'll see that John becomes this sweet guy. His at the Last Supper, he's he's resting his head on the on the breast of Jesus as they're eating their Last Supper, and and they're hanging out and they're having a good time. This is the same guy who wanted to destroy a whole crowd of people with fire from the sky. So willingness to be transformed, <clears throat> holy listening. So John wasn't transformed by. Paul, or Saul, was transformed on the road to Damascus. He had this mystical experience where he was blinded and he had a vision of Jesus and, you know, the whole thing. Uh, John doesn't have that. John listens. He listens to Jesus talk. He listens to the stories. He listens to the parables. He listens to the teachings. And through that, he becomes a convert. and He becomes a follower of Jesus. So holy listening is one of the qualities. Loyal. This is one of my favorites. John is one of the only figures in the Bible who's with Jesus at the crucifixion. He's in the garden. He's there the whole time. Peter goes off and hides by the fire and denies Jesus. Uh, John is there at the foot of the cross while there are Romans looking for Jesus' disciples because they want to stick spears in them too. You know? And John is right there. He's there with his mother, with Jesus' mother, and he's, he's not hiding. He's loyal to the very end. He's patient, all right? <clears throat> he, uh, yeah, he's patient. So he goes from, from wanting to cast fire down on people to someone who's leaning on the breast of Jesus. And, uh, and this is, this is the, the tolerance that he develops over this time. Humility. All right, so he has a degree of humility. He does not name himself in his gospel. He never, it, the gospel that is attributed to him, he never says, Hi, I'm John. Remember me when I'm dead. He's, he says, I'm the disciple whom Jesus loved, and this is the story that I'm going to tell. So it could be anybody. It could be all of us. It should be all of us. <clears throat> he serves. 
All right, so he uh, he prepares the Passover meal according to the the Bible. He's the one who prepares the meal and gets everything ready. He's a servant of the community. He's courageous. Again, we talked a little bit about this at the time when the when the apostles are being hunted down. He's right there at the foot of the cross. <coughs> he's trustworthy. Jesus entrusted his mother to John. You know, Jesus is dying on the cross, and he says, "Behold your mother, behold your son." And John, according to the stories, takes care of Mary until until she dies. He's contemplative and prayerful. So he went to the mount. He went to Mount Tabor with Christ to pray. He uh, he asked uh, he asked Jesus to pray for him on the Mount of Olives. He went to the temple to pray. So prayerfulness and contemplation is another quality of the beloved disciple. Studiousness. John knew all the scriptures. So John uh, makes a lot of references in the, in the Bible in the in the fourth gospel to things that came before. You know the the scriptures uh, references to things that a learned person would have known at, at that time, and takes all of that information and translates it into something that he can go and then teach to the rest of his community. So, love. Uh, this is the most important part of the Joannite tradition. Um, it's the, the beloved disciple. You know, John is the disciple whom Jesus loved. And John, in turn, loved all of his his people as well. I mean, they thought very highly of him. Obviously, they continued to write books in his name for many, many years. Um, so he says, Behold thy mother. Uh, so this doesn't only link Mary and John, but it also makes John the brother of Jesus, or the stepbrother. You know, he's saying, Here's our mother. Love, love our mother. And it points to a special place in devotion. Yes. An honoring of the Theotokos by the church. Yeah, yeah, and you know he's. It, it's a. It's a spiritual family. You know, we're, but it's a family that we get to choose. You know, we get to choose to love. Uh, you know, our Joanite family. Of course, we love our our own families, but we. This is a a choice that we're making. This is the love that we get to share with each other. Uh, and those are the qualities, and I just, I love that. I'm sure he did a much better job explaining it than I did <laughs> when he came up, when he did the uh, presentation this summer in Australia. But uh, are there any questions? Did I screw up any dates tremendously? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. You said he prepared the Passover. Hmm. He prepared the Last Supper? Yes. Well, there are different accounts in the different Gospels. The Gospel of John says they had the Last Supper before Passover. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. well, the, the tradition, like yeah. People have been figuring over the chronology. Yeah, the yeah. 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 It, it's, it's tradition. It's, it's not necessarily historically factually true. I, that is uh, that's the tradition, right? That he pe prepared the well, the Passover meal is, I think, what is specifically referred to. I I'm going to have to look. I don't know exactly off the top of my head, but, but never did. He, prepared he prepared a meal. He's a servant. <laughs> he, he cooked one time that week. Yeah, he yeah. <laughs> Somebody asked him to do the dishes this one time, and he did. Because folks have gone back and forth. Was the Last Supper a Passover meal? Yeah. Was it, was it something else? Mm -hmm. So I might I might be conflating the two events, or you know he might have. Most folks traditionally most folks do. Yeah. And when it says the eve before the Sabbath, they mean the Sabbath Sabbath or the holy day Sabbath. Hmm. That's what the gospel says. The day he was crucified the day before a high day. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Yes. Just uh, on the on the Trinitarian, mm -hmm. um, uh, 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 it sort of jumped at me as you were reading the. Uh, statement of principles, and when you read them the night, um, the the Sethians would not have had uh, that trinitarian formulation. They would have talked about father, mother, son. Uh, some of them certainly would, yeah. And the mm -hmm. Valentinians, while using trinitarian language, would not have used that as their primary reference to divinity. Mm -hmm. It would have been the one, or it would have been the thirty. So does the Trinitarian uh, component of modern Joanite theology, is that something that would base to the Palapath? Oh, uh, that I don't know. Um, yeah, I have, I have, when the second version of the Leviticon comes out in English, <laughs> we might have a better idea about that. I'm yeah. sure that there are people who know. Well, um, to that. 
yeah, yeah. yeah. But I'm not, I'm not, I don't know, I don't know off the top of my head. Good question, though. You're right. I mean, um, Joan agnosticism is not Sethianism. It's not Valentinianism. It is its own different thing. It, it, you know, certainly has respect for those traditions, for, for the, the past Gnostic traditions, but it is a modern expression. Well, and as you mentioned, there's a Joanite component in all of this. If you yeah. Irenaeus, uh, for instance, complains about the Valentinians. And he says, these guys, these guys are crazy about the Gospel of John. What about Matthew, Mark, and Luke? Yeah. And, uh, because John, and, it, and it's interesting because we see that not only in the Valentinians, but in later esoteric books, where they'll have the Gospel of John open on them. Mm -hmm. You know, open drinks and rituals and things like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing I was reminded of when you were talking about love is if you read various things on the Church of John, the Secret Church of John, they will point, they will refer to it as the Church of Amor, A M O R, which is opposed to and opposite to R O M A. Roma. Mm. Roma. Roma. So it's the opposite of the Church of Rome. You have a more, and you have Roma. Yeah. Um, another point about the the Joanite divine love uh, uh, bit. There's um, there's a video that will be coming out soon from the this past summer's uh, Joanite conclave. We have a conclave every year where where a lot of the clergy and and many lay people kind of get together and we hang out and we have classes and and uh, it's our our church's annual meeting. <coughs> So this happened this past May in Australia, uh, in Sydney, and the newly minted bishop from Sydney uh, gave a fantastic presentation that I can't wait till you can all watch on YouTube. It's coming out very soon. Um, it was it was so touching. Everybody in the room was tearing up about the 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 love of our Johannite family. <laughs> Maybe I'm a sucker for that kind of thing, but it was nice. It was very nice. Anything else? Mm -hmm. So, uh, not to cut off any questions, but before we do wrap up, uh, maybe you should talk about where to find Leviticon, where to yes. find other resources, mm -hmm. and the YouTube channel. Yep. Join yep. Stuff. Yep. Uh, so you can find the Leviticon uh, by going to our website, joanite.org. Um, it is under publications. I, I think it. I think it's not on the front page anymore, but it, there's a menu bar at the top, you can click on publications and that'll take you to a link where you can buy it. Um, it is, uh, well, it's $20 here. I'm not sure where it, what it is in most places. Sometimes Amazon does weird things with the price. Of course, if you buy it here, it supports Gnostic NYC. No pressure. Um, it, for more information specifically about the Joanites, I would look at our webpage under, um, uh, what's the heading? Joanite Spirituality, I think, is the heading at the top of the page that you can click on. It has the Statement of Principles, and it has uh, some frequently asked questions that are helpful that people ask frequently that we have answered. So uh, you can read all of those and, uh, and, and kind of get a better idea of what we do. If you are in the New York City area on the 28th, is today the 21st? Yeah. So on the 28th of October, the very first Mass of St. Sarah's Parish, the brand new uh, parish of the Apostolic Joanite. Sorry, St. Martin's Parish. St. Sarah's is the one I came from in Boston. I'll do that 50 more times. Um, St. Martin's Parish, the, f the very first Mass of St. Martin's Parish. So uh, 150 West 28th Street. Number 303. Number 303, thank you. Um, and uh, that will start at 1030 in the morning on the 28th. So if you're in the area, please come and join us. Uh, see what the Joanite liturgical experience is like, not just the, the history and all of that. Uh, uh, the, the church's YouTube channel is Joanite Church, and we trickle out videos from our lectures uh, at, that we have at Conclave uh, throughout the year. So there'll be more coming up very soon. Uh, we have a whole bunch on deck of some really, good, some really great stuff that's going to be coming out soon. So. I know there's probably a link to that somewhere off of the website as well. And of course, if you have any questions, you want to ask me any questions, it's anthony.sylvia, S-I-L-V-I-A, at johannite.org, J-O-H-A-N-N-I-T-E dot O-R-G. Email me. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Or if you're in the room, you can ask me <laughs> personally, but for the video. All right. Well, if there's nothing else... Oh, yes? Okay, inquiring minds in fandom want to know, is there any connection with the conception of the Johannine Church 
has elaborated by Jeffrey Ash from cryptic hints in the questions of Bartholomew by way of the Blessed Joachim and Boisman, and further run into the ground by Paul Anderson in Operation Chaos. You made an awful lot of references I'm not familiar with, so I don't know. What <laughs> So the answer is presumably no. Uh, no. Well, no. Don't take my ignorance for any statement of anything. I, I'm, not a, I'm not a member of the Joanite Church. I'm a member of Sister Church. But, as a, but the Joanite tradition written large has been that I'm going to go out and see that a lot of folks, if you mentioned from uh, sort of early theosophists, I mean, hmm. theosophists, not the sense of Lebowski and racism, but in, in the sense of Burma and that crowd. <coughs> folks from that era would reference the Church of John, whether they meant mm. a, an actual organization or not is, is not always clear. Right. It's my suspicion that there was that there are very few times in history when there was an actual church organized group of people called the Church of John. Um, yeah, that's why I specified the conception. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Now there's a there's a set of of ideologies, a set of of principles, a kind of set of aesthetics and morality, I guess you might say, that surround the Joanite idea that pops up again and again and again. But as far as actual historical organizations with paperwork and, you know, and, and meeting halls and things, there were probably very few times in history when there was a YouTube church channels. of guns. YouTube channels, yeah. Yeah. So, I don't, I don't want it... The, the, our, our history states... <laughs> Excuse me. Our traditional history states that there's always been a Church of John. My interpretation of that is uh, there has always been a concept of a Church of John, and the, the the ideas of the Church of John have been perpetuated in one form or another. Um, but it's entirely it, they call it a secret church. It's entirely possible that there was actually a secret group of people who have preserved the traditions down through the ages. I'm not in that club. I don't know. Uh, I'm in the club now. <laughs> I wasn't in the club when there wasn't a Joe and I church. So I don't know. All right. Well, let's, as a, yeah. So if you have a couple minutes, as a, as a preface to next week, mm -hmm. could you comment on the differences and the similarities between the Joe and I mass and what folks may have seen as a traditional mass? Oh, sure. Um, the Joe and I mass is framed along the same lines as a Roman Catholic Mass. So if you've been to a Roman Catholic Mass and you go to the Joanite Mass, if you aren't paying very close attention, you'd probably think it was similar. Uh, and it is similar uh, along certain lines. Um, our, our Mass, again, our church is only 12 years old as in the current form. Um, so our, our, our um, Source material, I guess you'd say, comes from uh, a couple of sources like the Liberal Catholic Church, um, the uh, uh, Ecclesia Gnostica, um, and some other, you know, various bits and pieces here and there. Uh, there's actually quite a bit of Buddhism, as you might imagine. It's it's not really explicit Buddhism. It's kind of undercurrent, but again, Gnosticism and Buddhism are kind of cousin traditions and you see a lot of overlap, but as as I mentioned, our original patriarch left the church to become a Buddhist, so you, you might imagine that there's some Buddhism that kind of floats underneath there. Um, Buddhist concepts, I mean, not Buddhism proper. I, I don't want to. Buddhism is its own thing and it's great, but and, and it's not what we do, but we certainly it, it, the symbols share a lot in common. Um, so, <clears throat> The, some of the things that set our church apart is we have a, um, a bit of a hermetic flavor to our, our liturgy. Uh, hermeticism is, uh, if you don't know what it is, it's uh, the tradition that spawned alchemy, um, the, the writings of, of a probably mythical historical figure called Hermes Trismegistus, the thrice great Hermes, um, wrote a lot of things uh, you might have heard, as above, so below, that is the hermetic axiom. Um, so a lot of our, our liturgical tradition contains references to emanations. Uh, we have the we call four archangels to be present during the mass, and the four archangels are associated with the four classical elements, which is a big part of hermeticism and alchemy. Um, and a, a, the the some of the associations that are made between the four archangels and the four elements that we associate them with come directly from the hermetic tradition. Um, 
and a few other uh, points here and there. Um, what what else would you say about it? I, yeah. Well, and also, um, I guess one point is that's different, vastly different from the, the Roman Catholic Church is your institutional marriage. Right, right. Um, a, a big part of well, it's not a big part actually. It. Uh, the Templar story that I told you today, w that it appears as this kind of poetic narrative in our liturgy. Um, we don't say it every time we have the liturgy, but we will uh, because it's, it's going to be our first and it's special uh, next Sunday. So you'll hear the story of, of the Templars and, well, actually all the way back from Moses. It starts with Moses and goes through. And this is a tradition that comes out of the Templar story, the Bernard Raymond Fabry Palaprat. Templar story, which made its way into Freemasonry at the time, and was preserved through Masonic sources that we then brought back into church sources. There's a there's a long history of uh, relationship between Gnosticism and Freemasonry, which is a whole other topic. <laughs> yes. Um,